Welcome to the ninth in this monthly series of Poems to Live For, which is brought to you by the Hippocrates Initiative. I am Donald Singer, co-founder with Michael Hulse of the Hippocrates Prize for Poetry and Medicine, which is now in its twelfth year. Today we shall hear readings by poet, translator and critic Michael Hulse and special guest, novelist and poet Louis de Bernier. I shall hand you over now to Louis de Bernier to introduce Michael Hulse. Good evening, everybody, or good morning if you're that side of the world. I'm here to introduce Michael Hulse, who I'm sure you know already. I think I first met him at the King's Lynn Festival a long, long time ago, and we've been friends ever since. His father is British, his mother is German. He's worked for 25 years in Germany. Um, since 2002, he's been working at the University of Warwick and edited, done a lot of editing, uh, including the Warwick Review, to which I think I once made a contribution. Um, he's a prodigious translator. He's won many prizes. Um, his poetry is technically masterful and more importantly, emotionally very powerful, and I admire it very greatly. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to Michael. Thank you very much, Louis. <clears throat> the waiting room. Seems a long time we've all been here. The magazines are full of the usual stories. Mother Teresa and Kennedy and Robespierre are dead. A future UN Secretary General has been born. The old woman tells me of gathering nuts in her childhood. In those days, the sun was shining, or else it was raining. There were times in her life that were good, and times that were bad. I still remember the taste of those nuts, she says. The view from the window is always of the night. The moon, like Tristan Sarah's monocle, Looks like it's seen it all before, finds most of it a bore, but might consider shining anyway. Truth is, I don't remember why I came. I don't remember who I was before I waited here. I don't remember if I had a name. Still, there's little point in going home. Tell me a story, says the little girl. A story is not an asset-backed security, says the banker. Security is beautiful of itself, says the sophist. Count the bell, says the man with the hourglass. The toll is full and golden, like a pear plumped up with sun and rich with heady musk a gong of sweetness sounding in the dusk. Then heavy silence settles on the air. <clears throat> in the past hour, I've changed my decisions about what I was going to read until I saw what was happening in the at the Capitol today in Washington. I had a different program, but I've now decided that I'm going to read a couple of Chinese poems. Um, one of them goes back to my very first book. I'll hold it up here. It's so black, you can hardly even see the writing on it, but it's called Knowing and Forgetting. This was my first collection in 1981. And this is one of the earliest poems. Well, it's the earliest one that you'll hear tonight. And it's called Village Performance. When I was an undergraduate at St. Andrews, I used to like to just spend hours among the magazines from all over the world in the university library. And there was an inadvertently funny one, which was called Chinese Literature Today. It was supposed to be quarterly, but by about March, they'd already usually published three of the four issues for the year. They were that keen to get the stuff out. And it was wall-to-wall -wall propaganda. And in one issue, they had a special feature on contemporary Chinese painting. This was in 1976. 
and the painter Wang Li Ping had painted a traveling theater show of the kind that went around in the 1970s to villages full of illiterate Chinese who needed to be told the messages of the government. So what the, what the troupe was performing was a propaganda play. This is a poem based on that painting. <clears throat> Village performance. In a quiet part of Yunnan province we live, and now that night is drawing its blue blind down on the world, and a thin white hammock of moon hangs relaxed in the nude ultramarine of pure sky, we have come to stand on a dun, dusty, stony patch where the air is sultry with maize and sweat and leafage and sweet evening and shake off the day's desolate sameness. And we watch the players savor each splendid sweep of a shaping hand, fist of perfect formulation, motion of making of what's made with method. The boy in palest blue shakes thin tintinades from his flute and the nation listens, approbation creating our faces, drawing directions and desires onto the human planes of bone and skin. The naked bulbs with blue shades shed light where it belongs. In the trees, loudspeakers hang and you can see and hear it so well that in the end, maybe you see nothing at all. The cymbals batter, the drums button thump, the accordion player smiles. We love it. When later we leave on our yellow bicycles, past the telegraph poles and the village dynamo, where the world's pulse throbs dull as thunder, the hero's heart beats in our breast. We too, are travelers with the moon through night to the west. And one day we will see wonders. We ride away under the endless pity of the stars. <clears throat> and a sort of companion piece, I suppose. Um, I'm going to read a poem from a book of the early 90s. The poem, A Chinese Tale, uh, was a response to the Tiananmen Square killings in June of 1989. It was in the London Review of Books and was reprinted abroad in Lettres Internationales. And um, it takes off from a story, a fairy tale, that was in a book of Chinese fairy tales I had as a little child. And in the story, um, a jealous teacher tried to kill his very gifted uh, boy pupil by throwing him off a mountainside. Um, he'd told him to wait for him there and hoped he would starve to death and that he could make um, stones into rice by cooking them on his feet. And the boy, of course, believed everything his teacher said and did as he was told. After the boy was taken to paradise, the teacher tried to throw himself off the mountain thinking he would go to paradise as well. But of course, he just came to a sticky end. That's the story behind this Chinese tale. <clears throat> I dreamt I was the simple trusting boy who took his wicked teacher's jealous hand and climbed the mountain and the teacher said he had to go away, but he'd be back. And if I happened to be hungry, why, all I need do was eat the stones. His eyes were fine strokes of a calligrapher's brush, conveying messages I could not read, though how I longed to learn and understand. I thanked the honest man for his advice and said that I would wait till he returned. He told me patience was a discipline invaluable to a man and left. The day was bright and I was young in hope and I questioned the sun and the sun replied, study, be humble, be truthful, aspire. And I questioned the sky and the sky replied, study, be humble, be truthful, aspire. And night came 
Sonic Moon replied with a smile, oh, be truthful, aspire and keep up the studies because you know that all will come to him who learns and waits, but don't overdo the humility boy. And in the morning I was cold and hungry and I recalled the honest man's advice and went about collecting stones, although I must confess I'd never heard that stones were good to eat. An inspiration came and prompted me to warm them on my feet, and in their place I saw a bowl of rice and ate of it till I could eat no more. And I questioned the sun, and the sun replied, study, be humble, be truthful, aspire. And I questioned the sky, and the sky replied, study, be humble, be truthful, aspire. And night came. And the ironic moon replied with a smile, you're on the right track. But remember that studies are means, not an end, and aspirations the vehicle, not the goal, and humility may be counterproductive. And even the truth isn't always the answer. And in the morning I breakfasted on stones. And the days went by, the days became weeks, and knowing that patience was a virtue invaluable to a man, I waited, hourly expecting my honest teacher's return. And after 40 days, he did return, important in his venerable robes and seemed surprised to find me still alive. He listened with a serious expression as I explained about the stones and rice, the fine strokes narrowed into finer strokes I told him the sun's reply and he smiled. I told him the sky's reply and he smiled. I told him the moon's reply and he frowned. And then it seemed I fell from off the mountain, uncertain whether I was pushed and woke at daybreak on a square where people cried and ran and fell and lay where they had fallen. And I questioned the rising sun and the sky but they made no reply. And I questioned the setting moon and the moon replied, today you died. <clears throat> At intervals as we go on, you will have love poems. And this, although it may not sound like it at first is a love poem, but it's also about this wonderful business of the mouth and the breath and what we do with that. It's called The Architecture of Air. <clears throat> Though the waters still lap the ghat at Udaipur, and the Minoan bull still leaps at Knossos, Frederick's spirit still frets in Knobelstorff's marble halls, and at Azé le Rideau, bankers and kings contest the ghosting rites. Those stupefying superstructures of beauty still conform to the paradigms of power. My lady paints an inch thick, my lord drives a Porsche, and fake apartment blocks line the approach to Termini when Hitler visits Rome. Our architect is still the architect of air, the making mouth, shaping the living breath teeth and tongue and lips, building a word or a kiss, expressing the inexpressible this. Whatever we say is said against death. The gods are gone. In the Sistine ceiling, a crack has come between Adam and creation. The bombs explode in Belfast and Borobudur. Petra, wears away to ignorant rock. Whatever we say is said against death. Whatever we say is said against death. Adrift, listen, you whisper, finger to your lips. The oars shipped, the air unstirring, water dripping in stillness. And breathless, we wait 
to hear each other say three simple words. <clears throat> I was once asked after a reading what the words were. So some of you know, some of you don't, that I had a, um, a, a, a partly German upbringing because we spent every summer in my mother's home parts near to Trier on the Mosel. And I've spent half of my adult life in Germany as well. And this poem is set in Trier an ancient city, a Roman city over 2000 years old. And in its cathedral since the 13th century, they have had a relic which is believed by the faithful to be the garment. They call it a tunic, a tunica Christi, which Christ was wearing before it was taken off him and the soldiery um, drew lots for it. And I was taken to see that when it was exhibited in 1959, when I was four years old, and I have only the very, very haziest of recollections of that. So when it was next exhibited in 1996, it's usually shown about three times a century to the faithful, I went back, although in the meantime, my faith had left me, unfortunately. <clears throat> the Tunic of Christ. To wait here, torn in heart and mind, in a querulous line of religious trippers in sneakers and t-shirts and jeans, to take a second look at a garment that may have clothed the flesh of Jesus Christ, the flesh of God incarnate, the God in whom I cannot, if I would, believe, to stand here half a lifetime later and recollect the funeral patience of solemn Sunday dresses, suits and ties, throbbing Latin, murmurous as diesel, waiting first in the hard bright square and then in the candle dark cathedral to see the tunic he wore in his final hours for which the soldiery cast their lots. To bide the high story as if it were true is to be that wide-eyed, credulous boy again, in the fifties gloom of adult obsession and grief, the Catholic half-light of guilt and devotion, of fear and deception and majesty, a four-year-old led by the hand of a mother and taken in trust to the heart of the dark, delivered to all of the terror of ages, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I stood here then, at the close of the decade of Bobby Sox, Korea, Dien Bien Phu, Eisenhower, shark fin Cadillacs, kidney-shaped occasional tables, Algeria, Stalin's death, and polka dot frocks. Then, as a child, I knew nothing. Now I know less. And I'm here in a city as old as the bread and wine to look once again at the tunic of Jesus Christ. A darksome stuff it is. Untouchable, frail as the binding of a book gone brittle with age, fissured like ancient paper, falling apart with time and meaning and seeking after meaning, flaking death from death, like slate or like shale, scaled like the ochre ages of the earth. A soil once good, ploughed and furrowed, crumbling now, a dust again becoming dust before my eyes. Nothing it is, to nothing it returns, it is all things on earth. It is the earth. 
To look at it is to behold myself, the semblance of my nothingness, my field once fertile, left to lie fallow, the binding of my book falling to dust, the text of my life fading from the page, the page itself as if it had never been written. To find a consolation here. To think Christ, gone but present yet, dead but risen, nothing but everything, and forever. I have been trying to pray, or trying to try. Such tenderness I feel for that good man, so cruelly, indifferently killed. And still I cannot think him more or less than one good man killed as the world kills men. This is a scrappy old fact of cloth. And my past whispers how good it would be to believe in it all, to believe in it all and to be a child again and wander forever amid the murmur of bees in summer meadows with wildflowers over my head. God knows I've been trying. God knows I've been wanting to try. But I've walked on and clear of the line and out to the sun-shot dusk of a world becoming dust. <clears throat> I think for this first half, I'll read one more poem and then I'll hand over to Louis. And the poem, I should apologize to anyone who is familiar with the books because I'm jumping to and fro quite a bit. That last one was from a book in 2009, The Secret History. I'm going back now to 1991. Um, it's a poem called The Country of Pain and Revelation. It's about um, seeing a car accident on a motorway. I suspect that it's in some sense it's really about the death of my mother because she died in a car accident. <clears throat> the Country of Pain and Revelation. The woman sitting on the glinting barrier watching a stir of air relentlessly uplift the silver undersides of leaves is breathing very carefully as if afraid that she might be too tender for breathing. Her hand is resting in the dusty hair of the man lying jackknifed on the grass between the glittering strips of metal that run down the center reserve. She does not see the slowed traffic, the flashing lights approaching. She is elsewhere. Again, the country of pain and revelation has a guest. Again, the great light has ground the peaks to powder. Again, in the valleys, the shadows have sheltered the traveller standing alert at the rail of the ferry, the trader bargaining with the goat herd, and the trapper still and meticulous in his secretive sidelight. It is the discovered country from which returning in wonder, as if from memories of the dreams we thought forgotten, we sunder in awe, wanting. What is the meaning of graining in a rock face? What annunciation hides in a hut built high on an outcrop overlooking the nowhere, bared to the higher nowhere of the air? And why must we find that after our truest transmigrations, after our fertile hopes, we still are left with smashed metal and glass, resting fingers in the hair of a dying lover? She knows the name of the place. Leaning forward, she kisses the dusty lips, 
and cradles his head and places her cheek against his. And he learns to say yes, say yes, and goes home to a lighted house, a dazzle of horror, security, darkness, and love. As you're conscious, we have a double bill today, and I'm very, very pleased and honored to be able to introduce now Louis de Bernier. He's best known to you quite likely as a novelist. The whole world knows him as a novelist. And he's also a tremendously listenable and readable poet. I first met him when he was actually guesting at the Kingsland Festival with his father, who was also a very listenable writer, as I recall. Louis is a tremendous writer. I've, um, I'm just going to advertise his latest novel, The Autumn of the Ace, which I requested as a Christmas present from my sister. Louis, I haven't yet started it because I'm, I'm stuck with Pepys's diary for the moment, which I promised myself was going to be my first retirement reading, but it's next. I just want to say before he starts that Louis is not only one of the most readable and genuine writers alive, but he's also simply one of the nicest people you could possibly hope to meet. And I just like to say that <clears throat> at a problematic part in my life, like one or two other people who are on this Zoom call at the moment, he was a magnificent friend, quite unfailing. Please welcome Louis de Bernier. Thank you, Michael. That's very kind. I am, in fact, going to begin with a poem that refers to the terrible time in our lives to which you refer. Um, we both had a period when it was a struggle to get a fair share of their children. And at one point, <laughs> I took my son Robin uh, when he was only about four years old, on a trip to Ireland. And this poem is addressed to him. I wasn't expecting him to be sitting beside me when I read it, and I'm not sure he's ever heard it before. But, but here we go. It's called The Only Road There Was. It was you and me. Your mother had left. They wouldn't allow us to take the girl. As if you can own a child as if it were nothing to be a father, be a brother, loving a daughter, loving a sister. And you were four years old, perplexed, confused, an innocent boy on the boat from Doolin Pier. It was you and me struck down by disaster. The passage made you sick. Out on the island we hired a trap. There was only one road to right or left. The pony was expert. The driver redundant, we rattled off up the only road there was. We stopped on a hilltop, wandered away in fields squared out by sad bulged dry stone walls. The wind soughed, the grass whispered, the sea sparkled, the boats in the distance as small as toys, the Atlantic sun benign on a couch of clouds. Among the burrows and stones, you found hundreds of shells of beautiful snails, gold and yellow, or striped in white and brown. You gathered them up, this fabulous treasure, and crammed them deep in our pocket. While back on the lane, the man with the pony waited to take us back down to the sea on the only road there was. You ate fish fingers, I ate lobster. You drank orange, I drank wine, father and son, side by side in the only place to eat. Then down on the beach you gathered shells, threw stones in the sea till the tide changed and the rose of Aaron returned. I was sorting through your outgrown clothes and found your shells in a tiny coat and it all came back. Buying a cladder in Galway town, fashioned in silver to leave to you in my will. Buying a fiddle you knew how to play the moment it came from the box chasing the seagulls, 
eating sarnies in cafes, riding for miles in Connemara, down on the beaches, you on the cob, me on the hunter. And every night I'd carry you up and put you to bed without your sister beside you. I'd sit at the foot and tell you stories of how you went up in the clouds and went to the moon with Sophie and looked at the cats because that's where they go when they die. I have some snaps the driver took of you and me collecting shells on Inish Moor, a few miles up the only road there was. Well, the next one is from the same collection and it masquerades as one of my memories. In fact, it's the memory of a friend of mine. He was separated from his wife and he was reminiscing nostalgically about how absolutely adorable she was when he first knew her. And he left me with this uh, lovely image which I sort of adopted as if it was mine. It's called, She Was Playing Schubert. I remember you best when you were 20, clothed in nothing but your waterfall of hair. Your locks were black, cascading to your waist. Your arms were white as moonlight. You were very petite. There was nothing about you a painter would have changed. It was summer. All the windows were open like welcoming arms. And you were playing Schubert naked before the piano, your delicate fingers teasing the keys. Your impudent, your impudent beauty silvered the room and all your life was before you. Now, um, Michael mentioned his mother's death. And I would like to treat, I wrote this poem in 2010 and I've never read it in public before because I was being too frightened of choking up conspicuously in public. Um, dying people have an extraordinary ability to choose the moment at which they die. My mother, had told my sisters that she wanted to be alone with me when she died and somehow she managed it. My father went out for a shave, one of my sisters had to go home, the other went out for a wash and I was alone with her at dawn when quite suddenly she woke up and departed. And uh, I wrote this poem um, which I hope I will be able to get through but this is the world premiere of it called My Mother Dying. As the leaf on the bare branch, so my mother's ruined flesh is trembling for the earth to break off, to drift, to float down, to settle and to crumble on the mould. As the small bird who flies abroad flits from the bare branch and rises on the wind, so does my mother's spirit longing for the sun, flick its tail, bob its head, brace, leap, take off by instinct to the far land unknown, unnamed, unknowable, but urgently desired. As the shipwrecked sailor, drifting for days, lets go at last of the floating spar, so does my mother kick her pain away. As the drowning creature begging for breath at last inhales the bitter brine, so does my mother, thirsting for help, breathe in death. New moon and Jupiter side by side, shoulder to shoulder, balanced above the waves, poised at the window, waiting in witness to these, the last delays of her voyaging soul. Then dawn at last, she opens her eyes. Look at the sea, sweet mother, look at the sea. But my mother looks at the sky. She closes her eyes. She breathes like one on a peak who climbs too fast, too far. On her behalf, I gaze at the sea, the boats on the skyline, the seabirds crying and wheeling. I kiss her hands, I choke, I say last things, and then it comes, the final bait of breath, the gasp, the leaving. Well, I am now going to read um, a poem called Stone Hotel from my collection, Imagining Alexandria. And it's completely self-explanatory.
Stone Hotel. The Stone Hotel in that Yorkshire town, the site of our first trip, not far from the park and the wood and the river that runs by the graves. I would think you remember it well. I'd booked two rooms in case it was wrong, in case your mind was changed. But you came to mine, and I was seized by your slender bones, your long gold hair that curtained your cheek, that fell to your waist, that you liked to use as a whip, the most exquisite, painless lash in the world. You told me tales of becoming bewitched, of your mad mother, your luckless father, your home in the wild, the shotgun under the bed. It was the first tryst, the first of too few nights, and we were foiled by distance, by prior commitment, events that spun out of control. I am writing to tell you that I took the wrong path, always did and always will. And I've just been back and they've boarded it up, our stone hotel that's near to the river that runs by the wood and the park and the grave. They're boarding it up and making flats without regard or respect for the room or the bed where once we lay and loved and talked all night on our first night, so long ago on our first tryst, when we were careless and bold. Um, this one is one of those poems that has taken almost a lifetime to write. The first version I must have written when I was about 24 and the last version when I was about 60. And I've got the wrong page. I think it might be 85. Yeah, excuse me, I have made a wrong note of it in the wrong place, so I should just go back and check it. 69, right here. Right, this is called Your Brighton Dress. I remember that dress. It was Brighton, a summer's day, out in the street, hung on a rack almost above our heads. Your eyes lit up. It was just your kind of dress, heavy fabric, soft and brown, exactly the shade you liked, the color of melancholy, the color of 1979, the year for people like us, a couple without a map, a country with nowhere to go, that had lost the art of laughing, didn't have muscle to breathe. In all the world, I had 12 pounds left, but I bought the dress for your body's sake, for the sake of your eyes' delight. It was a bridge, a perfect bridge for gentle, sweet desires. You loved me for the gifting of the dress. I loved you for your gratitude, your disbelieving face your little leaps of happiness. I have often remembered how off you went so many months off in search of yourself. Then back you came, let yourself in with your own key. It was late at night, it was almost dawn. You teased me awake with a kiss. Such slices of time have fallen away. I've scarcely seen you for longer than we had been alive. It was back in a former life, but I like to remember, false though this may be, that when I woke up and you were there, you were bringing me Mexican presents, wearing a silver necklace, wearing your Brighton dress. Now, um, I think I'm probably getting to rapidly to the end of my little slot. Now, but two of you have mentioned St. Andrews, so I think I really must read you a poem called You Came to See Me in St. Andrews. And coincidentally, it's about the end of the relationship that I talked about in Stone Hotel. Oops. 
Wrong book. You came to see me in St. Andrews. You came to see me in St. Andrews. I met your coach. We wondered what to do. I don't know what we did, but walked the streets in rain. It was too late. Our ship had gone. There we were, stranded together, confounded sailors on a buckled wharf, our boat a speck in the distance, reduced to a feather of smoke. And when you left on the same coach, you mimed with one finger the wiping away of a tear from the pale cheek that mine would never seek to press again. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Louis. <clears throat> to all of you who are devotees of Louis's writing, if you want to start up a petition in the chat room, please do it and we'll see if we can get him back to read more to us. Sorry about the kitten, by the way. <laughs> Apologize for cats. Everyone loves them. Here you go. So I decided for myself that I would read one or two things that I never read. And um, in a book called Half Life, I had a long narrative sequence called Foreknowledge Absolute. The title, of course, is from Milton, um, which essentially is about a fellow meeting a very stylish young woman at a party, and she happens to be deaf. And the story charts, charts their relationship, um, including the whole business of telling each other stories about your life to date. And all of those stories tend to come out of other people's books and so on. It's, it's a great place to to practice seeming to have read a lot if you read this sequence of poems. But I want to read you two bits of it. The first is the very first poem where they meet at the party. <clears throat> what a swell party this is. I'm sorry, I don't think we've met. Her smile is the melt of a snowflake in hell. Her eyes are the burn everlasting. The starlight at her ears and throat had ceased to be before I noticed it. She's wearing the new black. Her heels are like ice picks. Her skirt is of charcoal and ash. Her talk is of body parts hung in the trees, arms in the branches, a torso, a head impaled. I was there, I saw it. She speaks of a truth within all of the higgledy-piggledy relative anything goes of truths. The need to know your way through to the absolute. Next July, we collide with Mars. Call me death, she says. And this is, um, this is the 13th part of the 14 part sequence. And I've never read this one before. Um, a warning, it will be more comprehensible to those of you who remember Borges' story about Pierre Menard, the author of the Quixote. But it's really about umbrellas. <clears throat> Lovers rediscover boredom. This is one of those days. I'm watching Friends and then a shopping channel. She's been out to talk to the author of the Quixote, it seems. She asked him to sign her first edition, Nîmes 1904, of his monograph on the Characteristica Universalis of Leibniz, which she told him was far and away the funniest book she'd ever read. <laughs> what did he say to that? What do you think? Every writer loves to be told he gave pleasure. 
He showed her selected treasures from his collection. D'Annunzio's nightshirt with the notorious hole, an autographed copy of Colette's Hamlet on La Canebière, the knickers with which Anatole France had wanted to be buried. And as she was leaving, mentioned a sadness that overwhelmed him when he first beheld Les Parapluies. So many people, and not a single umbrella that wasn't black. True, she agreed, for it was the case, unarguably so. But still she was taken aback to see so many umbrellas crammed in the stand in his hall. However, she asked him, could so many of the living have left so many umbrellas behind? That one, she opened it up, might have been the very one, the sunnier one, Gene Kelly bought the following day, having sung and danced his older rainy one away. That could have served to shelter lovers parting in a parking lot. Pained beyond measures, the raindrops percussive on car tops all around. And that one, the parasol, ought to be held in a balancing act on the scalloped basin edge of a Roman fountain. It isn't often, the author told her, drooling like a Disney wolf, that anyone so appreciates my umbrellas. She furled them, replaced them, abandoned the mystery, took herself back, so she says, to the present, the clear and present world. <clears throat> So these poems are variations on love, as you see, and I want to read a little one which is about, about the misguidedness of thinking that love will last and can work and so on. Um, this is an old poem. 25 years old, more or less, uh, almost. And um, it came out of work that I did with a TV station in Cologne. We had a lovely program about a strange uh, ship's pilot in Brazil who would go out on the ships um, and then simply dive off the rail when they got beyond the limits and swim back. And sometimes he was swimming back from four or five miles out into the Atlantic. He was a phenomenal swimmer of a great age. He was known locally as the fish man. Jepeche. If ever I should think I understand the marriage of true bodies and true minds, remind me of the pilot of Aracaju, poorest seaport in Brazil guiding the ocean-going shipping out of the tricky estuary of the Rio Sergipe to open sea and diving off the rail. The man they call Gepeche, crawling through the miles of swell and foam from where he cannot have a home to where he has no home in his element. <clears throat> And on the same subject of love, um, my father and mother had their little patches, but were nonetheless devoted to each other. And late in his life, after my mother had died, um, my father sent me a little clipping from, I regret to say, the Daily Telegraph. Um, and anyway, this is from a body of poems called To My Father. Christ says that in the resurrection, there is neither man nor wife. But when did words have power to stay the bone-old longing 
for a life in which there'll be no parting anymore. I've kept it to this day, that paragraph you clipped a year or so before you died and sent me without comment. The only black-browed albatross known in British waters is back on Unst in the Shetland Islands, where nearly every spring since 1972 it has waited in vain for a mate. <clears throat> and here from the same set of poems in the spirit of filial love is um, a poem. I'm sure that those of you who have um, have lost someone will have had that sensation of looking for the person among the things, the belongings that are there. <clears throat> your ash stick in the hall, your pension book, your slippers, missile, cardigan, the coronation spoon we fed you with, where shall I look for you now? On the black harbour water, taking the bodies of Japanese shot in Stanley prison out in the night, beyond the Hong Kong three mile limit, wrapping them in army blankets, weighting them with bricks. Or writing this letter from Singapore, businessman to friend and member, wanting him to go to work to save a Pahang communist from hanging, stapling a clipping to the carbon afterwards, girl bandit Wong Ah Lan, 18, won't hang. I visited the temple on Penang, that dark nar narcotic mystery you loved, where at the start of every rainy season, pit vipers by the score seek shelter and are welcomed in. And when my eyes adjusted to the gloom, I made them out on wicker cribs and cradles, lethal, lovely, lazy with joss and eggs, ignorant of death. Shall I look for you in 626 Water Transport Company? Lee Enfield, number 25648 waiting for zipper. Sure you'll be the first to get your head blown off on a landing craft? Or shall I go back further to a boy as bright-eyed and original as Abel? The boy who rejoiced not an hour before he died in this bunch of April forget-me-nots on the table. <clears throat> The book that included those poems was in proof when my wife and I saw a scan of our daughter who was on the way. And I wrote a poem which crept in, as it were, at the very end of the book, which is called To Our Unborn Daughter. Daughter, this is a world of wonders. Bird song in an April dawn, sunlight in an orchard by a river, cherry blossom, summer rain, leaf smoke in October, snowfall, and the fragrances of apples, roses, rosemary, mown grass, wet earth. The taste of tiny forest strawberries, and one of the stranger wonders of all the world is humankind. Birds of the air, fish of the seas, horses, oxen, asses, goats, how their self-applauding Lord has used them. He's mapped shipping lanes on the oceans, drawn up agricultural plans, bred fellow beings to slaughter and slaughtered his fellow beings. And then he's talked his sanctimonious stuff about saving the earth. Forgive humanity its vanity. 
If there's atonement and reparation, they lie in language, laws, in lucent water terraces of green made to reflect the heavens of Java, in the labor of love that makes a vineyard, a city, the thought of God, in the carvings of nameless artists at Urnes and Chartres, in the music of Beethoven, poems of Wordsworth and Rilke, in the touch that was brought to the marble and wood by the hand of Michelangelo, of Riemann Schneider, in the love that was in the looking in the paintings of Vermeer. These, though not ours to give, are yours to inherit. Welcome, dear soul. The radiance that lights your mother's face is the same that you know from your home daughter, now come to our door. <clears throat> well, she did um, come to our door. And I'm going to read just two final poems, which will be in my next book when I can finish the darn thing. And um, but they're both um, unfortunately post-separation poems and the first the first which is very short is about the way that certainly I as a daddy um, would often wake up at night hearing my daughter calling for me in her bed from her bedroom when she wasn't actually there she was at her mother's this is when she's about five or six years old <clears throat> How often in the night your call of daddy has me on my feet, half waking, running to your side to soothe away your grief and your defeat, to calm and reassure, knowing the pain a daughter's going through who has no choice but to endure sorrow and loss forever fresh and new, only to find your bed empty, the dark and silence deep, your face and voice mere phantoms in my head, and you far from home in the other place. Um, and the last poem I'll read, unless you beg me to do an encore, <laughs> is a poem called the Ferrari and strangely enough it has a sort of a connection with the Hippocrates initiative because it was written in Chicago when we were holding our symposium at Northwestern University and I wrote it between about three and five in the night because I was jet lagged and couldn't sleep so I think of this as my Chicago poem in spite of the fact that the setting is Venice. It's called the Ferrari, but when she was younger, my daughter couldn't say the Frari, meaning the church. So she would say the Ferrari because she'd heard that on Top Gear. And uh, I say without any embarrassment that my daughter and I enjoyed watching Top Gear for its wackiness uh, when she was smaller. She looks back on that now from her vantage point of 11 years um, with a certain disdain, of course. The Ferrari. Here is the church and here the reflective water and there is the bridge we cross and 50 paces take us to the workshop where my daughter could happily watch all day as cats of glass and elephants and seagulls and flamingos come to their being in the making flame. This is the church where Monteverdi lies, the church where my daughter is careful to step on the rose-colored flagstones only, the church she infallibly calls the Ferrari, where dwell, we say, the trinity of Richard, James and Jeremy. And over there's the workshop where my daughter watches the flame of the gas jet on the glass watches the flare of the flame transfer a glow and sinew to the tractable matter. 
watches a droplet dabbed and worked and stretched until it lifts its head and is a swan. All over the city, the boats unload their made in China boxes and the shops that sell the glass no craftsman ever worked are selling the soul of the city. And this my little daughter understands. And in that understanding, I rejoice. The craftsman is an unpretentious sort, whistling at his work to country songs, discarding broken or misshapen pieces <clears throat> with a lack of fuss that can be learnt as well, just as one learns a lack of self-importance. 34 years he's worked in this one shop. My daughter first came here when she was four, then six, now eight. Tradition in the making. Some things she sees are worth far more than money. Venetian glass and mirrors, Trilling tells us, were crucial to the growing sense of self. She'll read it one day, but she knows it now. It's five, and past the church of the Ferrari, shop girls and office workers head for their trains. They can't afford apartments anymore that sell for silly sums to foreign owners. You absolutely have to come and stay. The people of the city live in Mestre. My understanding daughter lit a candle. Together in the church we said a prayer, but now I think we should have said another, for a world that values birthright over greed, a world that wants its beauty to be true. Daughter, that is the world I wish for you. So, Michael, we do, can encore. You, do, you have, do you have an encore in, in mind? We do have a lot of requests coming in. I do have a rather ridiculous poem, which I think goes into the next book as well. So I'll, I'll just read that. But I'm um, it's, it's called, oh, that lion. This is the box I've packed up my life in. I'm putting it into storage. Lots of smaller boxes in it. Yep, go right ahead. That, that's the box with the ashes of my parents. That one's the box of love. And that one's God. And this one here I call the box that talks because it's full of parsley, sage and rosemary. And this is the box of clocks. It ticks. And this is the chocolate box. Sure, help yourself. Look, here's the nativity box. And the little child adored by professors of crisis management, fraud and illiteracy, by shepherds, coopers, chandlers, wainwrights and blacksmiths, and by the ass of hope and the ox of despair, will be me, or so I was led to believe. And this is the natural history box. Got everything in here. Trees, and hyenas and slugs and locks and birds of paradise and seas and amoebas and wildebeest and concertinas and moss. No, I don't know how those concertinas got in there. I really should have thrown a lot of this stuff out years ago. That one's the pox box. Better leave it shut. Let's see. The wine box, the tool box, the toy box, the poetry box. There must be something else I can show you. The box of girls in shifts and smocks. The box of pots and pans and woks. The box of hens and chicks and roosters. And here it is, look, this is one of my favourites, the box of locks. These were snipped from the heads of Robespierre, Jane Mansfield, John the Baptist, Marie Antoinette. This was Rapunzel's. This was Ophelia's. This was the Lady of Shalott's. These were from the beards of Darwin, Brahms and Edward Lear. And this one's from the Trent and Mersey Canal. But it's always a bit of a business to fit it into the bloody box. In this little matchbox, is the seed the tree retreated into when we plucked its every leaf 
that day when my daughter defeated the wicked wizard. This is the little music box that plays La Vie en Rose. What else can I show you? Here are the socks box and the night scented phlox box and the school of hard knocks box and the box containing the skeleton of the lion that attended St. Jerome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Michael and Louis. We now have some time for some questions from our audience from all over. To start with, do you want to pick up on any questions, Louis, for Michael or Michael for Louis? Do you want to start, Louis? Yes, uh, but firstly to observe that your poem yes, about meeting death is possibly my favourite one of yours. Mm. Although running it close is the one about looking for chives in Northumberland with your father. I listened a, a, not a couple of years ago to Leonard Cohen's speech when he accepted the Prince of Asturias prize in Spain. And he, he said that he didn't really feel he deserved any credit for what came through him rather than from him. And I'm wondering, I, 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 I immediately identified with that. And I wonder if you felt the same about poetry that somehow it's not yours, it's, it's, you're a medium or something. Do you ever feel that? I don't like that at all. He never said it came through easily. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that if I said that every now and then I sit down and manage to write one in just a couple of hours, you might well believe me. It's true. It does happen, but mostly it's like chewing concrete. Really, hmm. well, it's a rare talent for a sculptor to turn concrete into things which are so beautiful. That's why I'm not a sculptor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but listen, listen. I mean, you. You're in a different discipline because yours is necessarily a big enterprise through time. And if I were to say to myself, I'm just going to write haikus, then my goodness, I could just write one every time I go and sit on the toilet, frankly. Um, it's, you know, there, there are short and there are long enterprises in life. Yeah. And, and, and a poem, as we know, it's never finished. It's only abandoned. But a poem is, in a sense, as time consuming as you want it to be, because you won't ever be satisfied with it. I, I, don't you nonetheless feel that there comes, comes a point quite suddenly and you think, OK, this is finished? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But with with the poems I wrote after my father's death, one or two of them were written more or less in a finished state within just a couple of weeks of his death. And there were others that I kept returning to over a period of, of almost 15 years. So that the sequence as a whole, I could say took 15 years to write. Um, there's a sense in which that statement is nonsense because most of the days in every one of those years, I wasn't working on the sequence, of course I wasn't. Otherwise I'd have got my finger out a lot sooner probably. Um, but the truth is that it just seemed to always be unsatisfactory and it took a long time till the words were in what I thought were the right places. Hmm. Your, your, your poems, they seem to come out pretty much perfect. I mean, I used to be a fan of Pablo Neruda, who, 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 who just couldn't stop writing. He just on and on and on and on. And everything he wrote was all right, but very little of it was actually brilliant. I, I've, often, I've often wished that Pablo Neruda had written less, but written a lot better. I don't know if you agree with me about that. I, I agree exactly with the way you put it as well, because you started by saying, I used to, like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. because, because that is exactly what happens with Neruda. He's very, he's, it's, reading Neruda is, I mean, I have to say, I've, I've at no point in my life been a great fan of Neruda. I have to confess that. Um, I know that for people who are native um, Spanish speakers, and especially for Latin Americans, he is God, of course. Um, we have a question from Anne Jay, I think from Michael, but perhaps also for Louis. The Hippocrates Prize is for poetry on a medical theme in the broader sense. And the question Anne had is with whether any of your poems would fit that theme. That I just wanted to say, yes, I do have one or two poems that could be considered medical because they have medical odds and ends in them after my father's strokes and so forth and in the last year of his life. Um, and in fact, I think that Donald, Wendy and myself have agreed that a couple of that sequence 
can find a place in a book that we're assembling gradually of poems to do with the brain and its various diseases and conditions. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think I've, I've done much in that area myself. I've just, seen, also, I've just seen that Christine Panule in Belgium has written in the chat, poetry is medicine. I think that is a very wise remark from an old friend there. What about you, Louis? I don't think I've written any poems at all which have a medical slant, actually. Uh, I'm afraid I've, I've got, made no contribution to that side of things whatsoever. First of all, thank you so much to both of you. It's been a, a really a, a extraordinary evening to hear all these wonderful poems. And my, my question was um, for you, Michael, and it was, I just felt like um, there was so much um, of the divine in these poems written by um, uh, someone who um, disavows belief in the divine. And uh, for example, um, there were lots of passages that reminded me strongly of uh, the Psalms and the wisdom literature. At one point you had a line that went straight from valleys to shadows and, um, I, I just wondered whether, um, I mean, whether whether that's whether whether you feel that kind of the language of the Bible and Christianity has kind of seeped in to your um, poetry, um, and and also I guess there's something about you know the divine, perhaps it is it, it, it do you, would you recognize that that description of of divinity in your poetry or does that sound like nonsense to you or like reading in it's not at all nonsense i i i grew up steeped in christian christian practice and although since my roughly the age of 20 i've thought of myself as an atheist I'm nevertheless an atheist who's made a lifelong habit of going to the great places of the church, of pursuing the reading beyond what satisfies most, and so on. So, um, and, and the truth is that although I call myself an atheist because I feel intellectually convinced that there is not and cannot be such a being as a god, um, Nevertheless, that conviction always remains at odds with the great, great hunger for spiritual experience. And partly I know that is a psychological longing to be back in the fully accommodated embrace of my childhood. But partly I think it is a, a human constant. And it would be very strange if, if someone who had some sort of literacy in religions excluded it entirely from his work, wouldn't it? Mm. But at the same time, there are many other things that I think that, that we, we could just as well be talking about different aspects of the literature of the world. I mean, um, there are many things that come into one's writing. I mean, there's a lot of my writing that's about the visual arts because for a long time I was involved with publishers and galleries. Um, there, there are many things that come in and and I think that in one way or another I seem to have emphasized the strand that you mean um, but I sort of began with those two Chinese poems uh, wanting to suggest with with a view to today's um, uprising at the Capitol um, that democracy always needs vigorous defense this is a platitude for those of us all who live in democracies, um, but those who live under the thumb of totalitarian regimes that still exist know very well what the dangers are. I would like to think that a strand of political writing is, is very strong in my poetry as well. So, so yes to what you ask me, but it's not the whole of the yes. <laughs> and by the way, I noticed in the chat um, that uh, Alex Johnson, how nice to know you're there. You're formerly a friend from Coventry and a student at Warwick uh, on the MA there. And um, 
if you can still hear me, hello, it's very nice to hear you, but I saw you also wondering, <laughs> wondering how one could retire from poetry. And the short answer to that is I haven't. Um, so you'll either groan or cheer to hear me say that. It's simply from the university position that I've retired. I, 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 say, I thought your, your poems were, uh, although they were very personal, there were themes that were universal to all of us. And for me, that's what, what humanity is. And humanity is medicine or medicine is humanity. That's just what I wanted to say. What, what, was it you who commented that poetry is medicine? Yes. Uh, no, someone else said that, but I followed on thinks about humanity. Humanity is medicine. Uh, I don't know. I, I think you must have a very, um, how can I put it? A very, a very sort of optimistic view of humanity. If you think about it, um, just almost everything that's evil also comes from humanity. I mean, nature is is amoral and therefore sort of you forgive it its cruelty you know you, you forgive a cat its cruelty because it doesn't know what it's doing but humans are morally conscious uh, in a way that other creatures don't often seem to be and that that means that we are both angel and devil we we we, we talk about humanity to denote the nice side of us we we don't uh, perhaps I mean, we, I think that ought to be balanced out with, with the understanding that, that equally inhumanity is ours. Um, there's a struggle between the light and the dark continuously through history. We, we all have the darkness in us. And a part of, part of being human, I think, is, is that struggle within us between the angel and the devil within. Because we're all coming from a place where we will relate to some people Okay, I, I understand what you were getting at now. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think that um, a, a good poem, when you finish reading it to an audience, the audience sighs. That, that's how you know that it's a good poem. You've made an emotional connection with the audience. Um, and that emotional connection with poetry, I think, is more important than an intellectual connection. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah? yeah. And um, I, I, always, I always think that if I've written something, the most the, the reaction that I would most dread from anybody would be so what? <laughs> yeah. A, a, a poem, a poem, a piece of writing, a piece of music has, has to mean something. It has to move the heart. Just to say, we've a note here from Dr. Arlene Ledesma, who's joined us from the Philippines very early hours of the morning, saying how much she enjoyed the, the evening. Wendy, you'd have further question for Michael, I think, about 15 years and <laughs> No, I just, I, I'm not trying to hog this, you just said that it took 15 years for you to think that you had finished your sequence of poems about your father, and I wondered whether that was a reflection on your relationship with your father, that perhaps you, you needed to fulfil in your writing, which hadn't been there, this is very personal, in, in your lifetime, because I think... The, um, well, the relationship with my father, as I look back at it, was, was an absolutely wonderful one. Right, okay, um, okay. But the thing is, it was a many faceted one. And, and the thing as well is that if you write about someone as important in your life as a parent, you don't really want to end up feeling you've said the wrong things. You want to get it right. And, and that, in a sense, yeah, it's, it slowed me down. It made me feel I couldn't I couldn't really move on to other things without getting that sequence of poems right. But, but it's, it's not something you want to keep on going over and over, is it? But you, you want to write it and you want to write it as well as you can. But in this position now, it, it sort of focuses the mind on what I think poetry is. And, and I do think that poetry that does not draw upon the whole of the experience of being human is diminished by its inability to draw on the whole of it. So as Louis said a moment ago, if it's just intellectual, that's not going to speak to people. It's got to address the feelings as well. But it's part of the total experience of being human. And another part of being human is my thoughts about what's happening at the Capitol. So I'm a political creature. I'm a creature that feels pain. I'm also a creature that does many other things, such as looking at films and reading. 
And I think that poetry that's not doing all of the things that the human being does is simply inadequate as poetry. It's got to be available to the whole range of human experience. And if that includes the dark side of us all, so be it. That has to be in there too. Louis, are you writing more poetry just now? Because I know you've you've just started another novel, I think you said. I have just started a novel, but I'm, I think I have at least one more poetry collection in me. I've got a number of unpublished poems, um, including some which are really very long. Mm. For example, one is called A Warbler's Wit Goodnight Story, and it's about um, a sea creature who's washed up on the beach. And it's a rather like a silky story, really, and it ends up going back to the sea. But that's, that's really quite long. Um, I find that with me, poetry comes and goes in proportion to the amount that I read it. But if I read a lot of poetry, if I have a craze for reading it, I'll, I'll start writing it quite a lot. And w when my reading craze goes away, then I'm back to writing prose. Um, I, I just rely on it coming back and being reliably um, you know, cyclical. Um, I am writing a, a, a sort of medium length novel now, which is a first for me in the sense that it's set in the future. Uh, so it's not historical for once. And uh, believe it or not, it's about a quantum cryptographer who's convinced that one day all our systems of codes and electronic controls are going to fail. So he moves to the wilderness to, to make sure that he gets through it if it happens. If you like, it's a sort of, it's not really science fiction. And unlike most apocalypse novels, it isn't about the apocalypse. It's about people sort of working their way up to it. And the apocalypse doesn't happen until the last page. But my last three novels were a family saga, and they were really terribly sensible in many ways. And I, I just now want to write something that's a little bit crazy and weird. So I'm going back to magic realism. Louis must be very irritating. And I, I'm always irritated when people just harp on about one thing in a review and forget the whole rest of the book. It's, it's caused by reviewers not having the time to read the whole book. But you often find that they, they misreport the story if you've written a novel because, because they, they kind of flick through it or browse it. They're against, they're, against a, a, they're against a schedule, aren't they? And that, the thing they had read the most is an enormous novel. But they'll never get through that on time to review it. So I, I suspect that that particular reviewer probably only read two or three of the poems. And Michael, how about you? What about projects in all your new spare time? I'm going to finish the as yet unfinished collection of poems. Um, there are friends on this call who will inwardly groan because they've heard me say that before, but I will finish it now. Um, I shall write a memoir because, well, because I have a daughter for one thing, but also because I have lots of fun things I like to put on paper. Um, plenty of things, actually. I don't want to bang on too much about them now. I've, I've actually got two books of poems on the go by now, I think. Um, in fact, The Waiting Room, which I started with, is not from the next book, it's from the book after that. Thank you very much indeed, Michael Hulse and Louis de Bernier, for a wonderful series of poetry readings and discussion. Before we close some brief notices, the next session will be on the 10th of February, when we welcome poems out of copyright suggested by our contributors. The following session will be on the 10th of March, when our guest will be Dr. Theodore Dalrymple, who will be discussing his, his book, Illness as Inspiration, the Poetry of Medicine and Disease. And as final notice, we're coming up now to the deadlines for the Hippocrates Prize for Poetry and Medicine. We have judges this year from New York, from the UK, from India and from New Zealand. The open and health professional category closes on St. Valentine's Day, the 14th of February. And the category for young poets aged 14 to 18 closes on the 1st of March. If you'd like to buy a copy of the 10 year anthology, you can do so by going to our website, hippocrates-poetry.org. On the website, you'll also be able to find out more about future sessions of our Poems to Live For series. For more on the Hippocrates Initiative and our Poems to Live For series, please email poet Michael Hulse or physician Donald Singer on hippocrates.poetry at gmail.com. Thank you.